Ephesians 3, uh, verse 14 to start out. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may feel to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, including this one, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. God, I do confess right now I need you. I need you to preach your word, to bring forth your truth the right way as you want it. And I ask that you would help me as the speaker and help us all as hearers to hear what you have to say to our hearts and to encourage us, as Steve had mentioned, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, this, this, this prayer is a, probably one of the most famous prayers you'll, you'll read in, in Scripture. It's a prayer to, to bring encouragement, encouragement to believers of Paul's day. And uh, I believe it wasn't just for Ephesian believers, as we've mentioned before, that this, this actually book, the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, it actually first started out without a title. It, it, it didn't say, you know, most books like Philippians, Colossians, will, will say to God's holy people in Philippi. That would be Philippians, right? Well, with Ephesians, it just says to God, it originally started as just God's holy people. It didn't say in Ephesus at first, as it says in our Bibles. You probably see that in a, on a phone app or whatnot, there's a little note if you touch it. So I believe that this, this letter is actually was a more cyclical letter for more general believers to all, for all of them to read. And it actually get, has the nickname of the queen of the epistles, the queen of the letters. So I believe Paul wasn't just trying to encourage the particular people in Ephesus, but actually all believers that would be exposed to this letter as it made its rounds to all the churches. And so he was trying to encourage them. Why? Well, how do we know that? How, how do we know that he was trying to encourage them? Well, quite simply... The verse before that, he says, do not be discouraged. Well, what were, why, were they, why would they have been discouraged? Well, an obvious reason would be, yes, they're, they're facing some persecution at that time, some intense persecution. But even more obvious is that same verse that I mentioned, do not be discouraged because, the answer is right there, because of my sufferings for you. Paul said, because of my sufferings for you. They were discouraged because he you know, as we know, he went through many trials, as we talked about last week, and he learned to look for the pony, look for the, where God was at work in the, in the trials that he was going through. And, but in this particular one, this trial was imprisonment. He was in house arrest uh, for the faith. So he, and we see that, you can, there's evidence of that when I mean, you just read the beginning of the chapter, chapter, uh, chapter 3 here and chapter 4 as well, both begin saying, I as a prisoner... For Jesus, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's not Jesus saying, I'm going to lock you up. No, that's saying he's, he's in prison because of his faith, because of his leadership for Christ. And so they were discouraged. All, all believers probably said, our, our leader, our fearless, faithful leader is in prison. Now, there could have been many things going through their mind like, oh, is God not able to deliver him? Or maybe thinking, oh, are we going to be in prison like him? Are we going to be persecuted? In such a way, well, Paul reminds them, hey, it's God, God's in control. Like Doug just mentioned, God is still in control. Uh, he said, Paul says, it is for your glory. He said it was for their glory uh, that, that God was allowing this. He was using this uh, as a way. And it didn't stop God's word from being chained. It didn't. Even though he was in chains, God's word spread. And actually, people would come and 
there would be hundreds of people that would just come to Paul and want to hear messages from him as he sat there imprisoned in his home. But we see this is an intense prayer. How do we know that? Well, usually uh, the Jews of that day, the custom was when you pray to God, you, you do it standing, hands up and look, eyes open, looking up to God. And we see there's, you know, Jesus would do that. Uh, I just think of the feeding of the 5,000. He broke the bread, right? And he looked up to heaven and he blessed it and he, and he thanked God. So in, the, in that day, it was custom to stand to pray. I don't know how, we, how you might pray. I, mean, I pray in many different ways, maybe, maybe sitting down, sitting at the table, maybe uh, kneeling at bedside or even laying down in bed, sometimes falling asleep. While I'm praying a lot of times. I mean, I'll confess, <laughs> but I pray in the morning too, so I make up for it. But uh, anyhow, we all pray in different ways, but it was normal back then. Stand up, eyes open, hands up to heaven. He says right here, it shows the intensity I kneel. I kneel before the, before the Father. That's showing me he's bringing out the big guns. I mean, he's getting serious with his prayer time here. He's on his knees, eyes closed, probably sweating, and just, and just praying for all believers to be encouraged and to know that they have a power, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, that is in them, that they, can, they have a resource they can rely on. So as we look at this prayer, and, and many have used this prayer to, as they pray as well. I've used it. I've used parts of it to pray with as well. Saying that God could do more than we can even ask or imagine, which is surely true. As we look at it, what is this prayer all about? What, what, what do we think, what do we see Paul doing here? If it's just a first glance, what does it look like? Yeah, for, for the longest time I saw it, I say, this is about the love of Christ. Because it says, how deep? How why? I think there's a song that might be about that, right? How mmm and wide. Does anybody remember that song? Deep and wide. Yeah, deep and wide, right? Or mmm and mmm, right? <laughs> I sang that one when I was, I think, six years old or so. I remember it. It's great. All right, so uh, I believe it's not about the love of Christ. Even though that is surely in there, and Paul wanted to show that to encourage these believers. Now, this is going to sound blasphemous. It's going to sound blasphemous. I know it is, and you've probably never heard me say this before. But what I believe this prayer is about, it's all about you. It's all about you. Where's Jason going with this one, huh? Uh, let me, uh, I, I, I highlight a few parts of this. Of this, of this prayer to kind of point out what I'm trying to say here and really what I, what I believe Paul was, was trying to encourage the people with, his people. He says, and as we know, if something's repeated, it's important, right? For this reason I kneel before the Father from, every, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name, even those families that have Paul in prison. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with the power to the Spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of of God. Now to him that is able to do immeasurably more than we even ask or imagine, according to his, ho his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So as you can see there, the you is about how Paul was trying to show that the power isn't all about you, but this prayer is all about you understanding that you have a power, that God's work, God's love, great love and great power, He wants to use, mostly do it through people, through His people. And here, it's, it's, it's a plural. It's Actually, it should be through y'all, all right, wherever you're from. Yeah, down in Tennessee, it's y'all. And if you order sweet tea with I, ass, that, uh, that little accent you can't forget there as a server, a cheddars, but... However you say, say it, you all, y'all, Pittsburgh gets yins, 
Maybe you've heard of that. But it's a plural. He's saying you, that you all would be filled with the power. You would, have a, you would know how great the love of God is. See, often I think we think of God's power as something outside of us. That He's going to do something outside of us. Like, for example, maybe hold off evil forces. Keep evil forces at bay, which He surely does. And prayer helps do that. Or maybe open a jail cell. You know, Paul could have used that probably. As you see, he did it with Peter, didn't he? He busted open, he busted open a whole jail cell. And, and Peter just walked right out. He, Paul, Paul could have, you know, he could have said, why don't you do it? You did it for Peter, why don't you do it for me, right? But he didn't complain. Because he understood that the greater work, not just that outside work of opening prison cells or maybe raising someone from the dead or healing someone physically. He said the, great, the greatest work is what's done inside of us. In us and through us as his believers. So really, as we, as we see that work being done in us, think of, wow, maybe when you first started out in the faith and someone did something against you you didn't like. It. Another fellow believer probably, right, that you're a close relationship with. And back when you first started, you would have flipped out. And you would have had a hard time forgiving them. But now, God has done such a great work inside of you. Now, you're looking at an opportunity to forgive. Forgive them and glorify God. An opportunity to share in the suffering of Christ. When, when others are doing something wrong, you suffer for it, even though you did nothing wrong. Well, as we see here, such work is done. This strengthening comes from the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of times we'll try to rely on ourselves, on the you. We'll try to rely on our strength, and that just makes a mess, doesn't it? I mean, a lot of, one guy has said it's like taking an F450 power stroke diesel truck, right? Brand new, powerful truck. And I know some are probably going to say, no, you should probably get a Chevy, right? <laughs> well, whatever, for, for the sake of an example, an F450 Power Stroke diesel truck, as if you just brought, bought that truck and then you tried to push it. That's like doing the work of God without following the, the Spirit and relying on the Holy Spirit. So I'd like to start first off as individuals. How do we do that? How do we get strengthened by the Holy Spirit? How do we grow in our, in our strength, in our inner man, as Paul says it here? strengthen, as the, as the Holy Spirit strengthens the inner man, the inner man, that, that thing that came alive in you when you became a believer. You know, to be a believer is not really going from bad to good, but from dead to alive. That inner man that came alive, that inner person that came alive, that's, that holds all your emotions, your, your heart, your feelings. Like when we say, I felt the Lord tugging on my heart. He's tugging on that inner, inner man, right? So how do we strengthen that inner man? Well, it first starts out with, starving the outer man. we got to starve the outer man. Sorry, we don't have notes up here, but you can put that, write that one down. Step one, starve the outer man. If you had a dog, right, keeps coming to the dinner table, begging at your feet for food, and you might like that, you might not, right? If you don't like it, and you're trying to get them to stop, what do you do? Stop feeding the dog. Stop giving it food, and eventually it'll stop begging, right? Just like our sinful flesh. We want that outer man, that sinful flesh that we have to contend with. We have, if we want to have less power in our lives, starve it. Whether it be our jealousy, our gossip, our lust, greed, sexual sin, lying, manipulating others, pride, gluttony, drunkenness. If you want to have, to have less power in your life to control the shots, starve it. Start starving it. Step two, simply pray. Pray. should always start with prayer, right? So this is more specifically for the, for the inner man. That was the outer man. This is the inner man. Jesus said in Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Right? Seek and you'll find. Knock, the door will be opened. And in Matthew 7 it says you'll receive what is good. But in Luke 11, Luke recorded it differently. He says, do all this, and you'll receive what? The Holy Spirit. See, 
They're not in contradiction to each other. Matthew was focused on the outcome. Luke was focused on the source to the outcome. You have the Holy Spirit and you follow His leading. He's going to lead you to good. He's going to lead you to good. So it starts off with simply asking. Asking for the Holy Spirit and His him to guide. Now, he'll probably bring some things up that he needs to address that might be a little uncomfortable. But that's, that's part of growing and becoming stronger in the Lord and enjoying what life is really all about. Getting, returning, repenting from our sin, turning away from sin, and being more like Christ. Step three is feeding upon God's Word. I think I could be in every sermon, right? Read your Bible. Pray. Every sermon, you can, uh, would be encouraged to do that. So, if weakening that outer person is, if you weaken them by starving it, starving that outer man, then to strengthen the inner man, we what? We got to feed him. Feed that other wolf, right? So he gets stronger. Feed him by continuous exposure to the Word. And we're doing that right now, aren't we? We're sitting down, we're, exposed, we're, we're opening the Word of God. We're feeding our souls upon the Word of God right now. But it can't just be now, right? Every day. And Jesus said, it's so important. It's probably more important than bread. He said, because man, he told Satan, right? When he was tempted, he says, man does not what? Live on bread alone, but on every, every word. Not just the ones I like. Every word that comes from the mouth of God and in God's Word. So opening our Bibles every day. You may be surprised how much just exposure to the Word of God will encourage us. You know, surely convict us. They, uh, I had a brother say, you know, the Word of God is double-edged sword, right? Hurts going in, hurts coming out. <laughs> That's true. It does hurt a lot of times, but it does bring comfort. It has brought so much comfort to my life and given me encouragement when I just need it. God spoke a word uh, through a psalm, uh, through a, one of the letters of Paul, maybe, that I just needed to hear that moment, all right? Step four is that once we hear that word and are exposed to it, trusting and obeying it. Not just information right, but let it lead to transformation. We can, we can quote scripture all day. It ain't going to do much good for us if we're not following it. James would agree, wouldn't he? He said, don't just listen to the word. Do what? Do it. Do the word. And if we, just, if we listen to it and we don't obey it, he says, like, lying to yourselves like deceiving yourself all right so that's how really how we do strengthen that inner man as a really as an individual i guess you would say i like to focus a little bit more now as a whole church because i think that's more paul's emphasis and desire here not just individually yes that's important but as a as a church body as a whole because he spoke in the plural didn't he well i got a pick here this is a this is a river I'm, I think I'm pronouncing this route right. Atchafalaya. The Atchafalaya River. Anybody heard of this one? It used to be the Red River, all right? But it kind of meandered over to the Missis Mississippi or whatever, the Mississippi. <laughs> to the Mississippi, and it became the Atchafalaya. All right, let me read this. So one, the 137-mile-long Atchafalaya River is the distributary of the Mississippi River that meanders through south central Louisiana and empties into the Gulf of Mexico, serving as a significant source of income for the region because of the many industrial and commercial opportunities it offers. Yet, as scenic, productive, and enriching as this river is, it owes all its strength, all of it, to the mighty Mississippi. It's because a distributary doesn't have doesn't have its own direct water source. It is an overflow of something else. So when the Mississippi is high, the Atchafalaya is high. When the Mississippi is low, the Atchafalaya is low. What the Atchafalaya accomplishes depends wholly on something other than itself. The church, the people of God, is like the Atchafalaya. Anything of value, of value she accomplishes is always tied to her source. So if she somehow loses connection with it, she loses all power. She dries up and empties. As we remain connected to the source, we remain in fellowship with other believers, we, 
with other believers, we, we remain in God's Word. We remain in prayer, in the Spirit. We are connected and we have that source. We stay connected to that source so that we can do what only God, God can only do what He does through, with His power through us. We can't do it on our own and change people's lives for eternity. And even more importantly, deal with each other, right? Well, this leads us to Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. The, the very verses after the prayer, it says, again, as you see, as a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble. Not just a little bit. Completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort, every effort, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Well, again here, Paul uses that plural you, y'all. It says, y'all do this, right? Be completely humble. Gentle. This is the way it looks to actually to be trusting on, relying on God in this way. To be completely humble, gentle, be patient, meek, loving, which will lead to peace. Now, this is not when 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 Paul says here, be walk worthy or live worthy of your calling. That's not he's not saying earn. He's not saying earn your calling because I mean, just look at it. It says you've already received it. Walk worthy of the calling you have received. It's a past tense. You already have it. You're called to a higher living. It's really, I've shared this before, it's, just think about a scale. That word that he uses is, in the Greek is axios. That's where we get that word axis from. And just think of a, you know, a scale. So it's pretty much lining your life up with how, what your identity is in Christ. Walking worthy to a, you, you're living, you're, you're hot, you're, your calling is so much higher. What are you doing way down here in the dumps? You are, a, you are royalty in Christ. What are you doing doing this? Live a life worthy, and you'll see. You'll see God do amazing things in your life. Things that you have, haven't, couldn't even imagine, as Paul shared in his prayer, right? Well, there's these four virtues that help us uh, to, to guide us in doing this, to live a life worthy worthy of our calling as not just individuals, but as a whole church. And these ones are really focused more as, as a church body. First one is humility. Now, sometimes we think to be humble is to badmouth myself. No, I'm created in the image of God. God created me. I'm not going to badmouth myself or somebody else that's made in the image of God. I like what Rick Warren, his definition is. He says, humility is not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. To have the attention not so much on yourself, but on others and God. You're still valuing who you are in Christ, but having your attention, your focus more on God and others. And if we do that, we're going to see God do immeasurably more than we could even think or imagine. You see, in Max Lucado, he said, if it's all about us, if it's all about me, it's all up to me. But if it's all about God and the focus is on him, it's all up to him. It's all up to him. Second is, uh, well, I read gentleness, but actually it could be translated also as, as meekness. Now, when we think meek, to be meek, we think somebody that's weak, fragile, right? To be meek is to be strong, to have a strength in you. It's to be able, it's to have every passion and instinct under control. Every one of your passions and instinct under control. That's what meekness is. Is. And no one can really do that perfectly on their own. That's why, really, it's being controlled by God. When you're completely meek, you're completely controlled by God. You're being led by Him, like a, like a think of a Clydesdale horse, right? Strength. Big, strong horse that's, uh, that's led. That's the kind of picture here of meekness, being led uh, by a, a bridle, right? Great strength under control. God controlled. And we often think, I want more of the Spirit. Really, when you want more of the Spirit, really it's having, letting the Spirit have more of you. Letting Him have control more of you. And we'll see uh, those great things He will do with us. Third uh, is, is patience. Patience. Now this is a really, right here is a picture of, I want, I want you to think of endurance. Think of victory. 
enduring to the very end, not giving in to the very end, actually enduring whatever suffering you're going through, whatever disappointment, being patient and, and enduring through it. And really, when we think of having to endure something or patiently wait for something, we think of something in our own individual lives, with our own lives. But really, what Paul wants us to see here is to really be patient in a different way. To be patient with one another. Bearing with one another. We need patience more, not so much for our own issues in life, personal issues, but patience to put up with one another. That can, that's how it can be actually uh, translated here. Bearing with one another, really it means to put up with one another. Uh, that's a memory verse right there. Put up with one another. You want to grow in Christ? Learn how to put up with other believers. Right? I think we're often tempted, someone offends me, I'm out. I'm going to another fellowship. You hurt me? I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable? I'm out of here. But no, if we want to grow in Christ, we put up with one another in all of our differences, right? We put up for the glory of God and just patiently wait. You will see. He will reward you. He will strengthen you in that moment. And you'll see I'm no longer a babe. You'll find out. And really, that's what Paul says. Don't, he's, he's mentioned in other places. I couldn't address you as, as ones that are, are mature. I had to bring spiritual milk to you. You weren't grown yet. And here he says, if you do all these, put all these virtues together, you'll no longer be babes. You'll be, if you're seeking unity, if you're seeking to love one another and put up with one another in humble faith, you'll be mature. That'll show your maturity. See, maturity in Christ is not seen in how well you know your Bible and Scripture, but how well you live with your brother and sister. Vance Havner said, spiritual birthdays don't tell us how far we have traveled, but just show us how long we've been on the road. So, if, if you're a person that can be patient with other believers, maybe, maybe you're more mature than you thought you were for how patient you are with other believers. Maybe you are more mature. Maybe you're saying, maybe you think, I can quote scripture and all this, you know, I have a devotion time. But I can't stand other people in the church, right? But really, if we, if we want to be mature, we're going to put up with each other and see them as, as, as Christ sees them, right? Well, the final virtue Paul mentions is, is love. Love. And I think we know what the Greek word is, right, here? Agape. Thank you. Agape. This is, uh, I like how William Barclay defines it as un, unconquerable benevolence. Unconditional and unconditional love that no matter what you do to me, I'll still seek out your highest good. No matter what you do to me, I will still continue to seek out your highest good. That's agape love. That's, that's real Christian love right there. No matter what my other brother and sister did to me, I'm going to still seek their best, best interest. Seeking someone's best even when they've done their worst to you. Still seeking their best when they've done their worst. Now we do all these, we put all these virtues together and grow in the spirit, grow in that inner man as we do that. Being humble, completely humble, being meek, having that controlled strength, being patient with one another, loving, agopying one another. That will lead to peace, as Paul shares. That's the final. He says it leads to peace. And what is peace? It's right, pretty much right relationships with one another. Having those right relationships with one another and also right relationship with God. A sacred oneness that is essential to our witness. Because what, didn't Jesus say, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another and also how you are unified. How you love one another and how you are unified. That's a sign Jesus gave to show that we're his disciples and that he is who he is said he was. Well, I believe we as a church, we can live up to our call. We can live up to that high calling we have, and we are, I believe, in many ways. But we have to continue to aim, continue to aim to be a church that walks worthy of its calling and just see God do more than we can even ask or imagine. Let's pray together.
God, we thank, we thank you for your grace, your grace that none of us have earned. God, we, and we know, we, we thank you that you are God who, who leads us to grow, lead us, leads us to grow for your sake, for your glory, for others' sake, that they can know you, and for our sake, uh, that we can know you even closer. We thank you for your word that you give us, God, the encouragement you give us in your word. Uh, help us to go from here and to grow in that inner man, and to be a, be a church that lives worthy of its calling, high calling we have received in Christ. We pray in, in his name. Amen.